for the audio or you can even watch back Giving players all the props or put them on blast We don't give no hot takes, only talk facts We're giving all our devotion Riding high on this wave of emotion Going all out, yeah, cause this is our time No, we no stopping us till we reach the finish line Can hold it down. Shout out to my man Sammy, got it Sammy. off the ground. And to all the listeners tuned in right now, got the baits, analysis, and speculation. This is sports talk for the new generation. You know where to find us, got a reputation. Sick podcast, your number one sports destination. We're giving all our devotion, riding high on this wave of emotion. Going all out, yeah, cause this is our time. No, we no stopping us till we reach the finish line. Listen to the sick podcast. The eye test with Pierre McGuire and Jimmy Murphy. The Stanley Cup winning Colorado Avalanche 
And after 22 years, Raymond Mark! The sickest NHL podcast. It's going to be sick. And welcome to another edition of the Eye Test on the Sick Podcast Network. Jimmy Murphy and Pierre McGuire here. I am uh, not at home. As you can see, usually have the eye test uh, background behind me, but I am up in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. So Pierre and I actually in the same state, but in different points. P- Pierre, you are up at Dartmouth University. Is that Hanover, New Hampshire? Uh, Hanover, New Hampshire. So I'm about two and a half hours away from you, Jimmy. I'm getting ready to do a little scouting tonight, Colgate at Dartmouth. And then tomorrow I'll be down in Boston and I'll watch uh, Harvard and, and, and uh, Colgate play. But what's interesting, every time I hear – Gary Thorne talk about Raymond Bork. One of the things I think about is our upcoming guest, Teddy Donato, when he broke in with the Bruins. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to ask him about this, but he actually played on the point on the power play with Raymond Bork. Yeah. And, and, you know, people forget that Teddy was a really, really good offensive player. He, especially in calls, but in the pros, I mean, he had such a creative mind. The Bruins had Cam Neely back then. They had, you know, Adam Oates. They had Raymond Bork. They had a ton of really good offensive players. But Teddy was on that power play, and he played with Raymond. Think about it. as a forward playing on the back end. Pretty cool. Yeah, and I, and as I was saying to you driving up here earlier when we were talking, uh, I remembered him as a fan. Just, you know, I used to go to the games with my grandfather then, and he came over from the Olympics. Uh, came right for, went to the Olympics and then went right to the NHL after him and Bob Joyce uh, together. And, they became a pretty big part of that team, uh, Pierre. I remember, and that I think that was the team that you guys beat in the conference final, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, hundred percent. Nineteen ninety two. Nineteen ninety two. You're spot on, Jimmy. Good mind. Yeah, um, yeah. Had a. Uh, well, Teddy, Teddy was part of something that I don't think Harvard will do again, and that is win a national championship. And that's not a knock. Their program's phenomenal. It's great. Yeah. But you, it's hard to beat the Big Ten schools. It, it's hard. You know, Quinnipiac won last year, and, and hats off to Rand Pecknell and his crew there. They did an amazing job. But it, it's so hard to win a national championship, and Harvard keeps getting great player after great player after great player. But it's just hard to beat, you know, those top schools out in the Big Ten. It's hard to beat BC and BU with the consistency. But for Harvard to have won in 1989 in overtime against University of Minnesota in Minnesota's backyard, that's a pretty amazing accomplishment. Yeah, that was monumental. Of course, on campus Friday here, looking forward to it. Ted Donato will be joining us shortly. The Harvard men's hockey coach, former Boston Bruin as well. Um, Pierre, one thing I noticed too, kind of, you know, researching for this uh, episode today with Teddy is uh, back then, and you were talking about it too when, when we were driving up in that same conversation. And they're talking about doing this now, Pierre, and I hope they do, giving teams that earn it, right, that finish high enough in the standings or in their tournament championships, uh, letting them play these NCAA tournament games in their own rink uh, and going back to that and doing kind of two of three, two out of threes like they used to do and you were telling me about. So I would I would like to see them do that. I don't know if you know if they're close to that or if it's still feasible, if, it, you know, if they do it in the neutral sites because there's more money involved. I have no idea, but I thought it was pretty cool that they did that. It, no, we did it. Um, when I was at St. Lawrence, we played the University of Wisconsin. We actually had home ice, and we had just won the ECAC championship. We'd beaten John LeClair in the University of Vermont. Mike Gilligan was the coach at Vermont, and he did a spectacular job with his team. Um, and the final four that year it was Harvard, it was Vermont, it was Cornell, and it was St. Lawrence in the old Boston Garden, a place I know you love and I love as well. And, um, you know, we were able to win. And so – we dominate Wisconsin for two games, Jimmy. So two games total yep. goals. Like we dominate them everywhere, except on the scoreboard. They had this 21-year-old freshman in goal. His name was Curtis Joseph. Oh, yeah. Just yeah, Curtis yeah. He yeah. <laughs> yeah. was on a show that night or two nights at Appleton Arena in Canton, New York. Most people probably have never seen goaltending like that in Canton before or since. It yeah. Was unbelievable. Yeah, that's the thing too, you know. And it, but at least you had two games, you had two stabs at him, right? Because now they yeah. just you get one and you're out. Yeah. Uh, so I, I would like to see them go back to that. Well, it's interesting. We'll see if anything develops on that. By the way, off the top of my head, I don't even know where's the Frozen Four this year. Uh, I'm trying to think now. Good Google it right now. It was in Tampa last year. Oh darn, I don't even know. Check it out for us, Jimmy. I didn't yeah, even look it up. Maybe There's we'll have to make good spots. Guess where? Oh my gosh. Let's see. I think. Yep. Speak of the devil, Minnesota. <laughs> in the just, XL Center. There you go. <laughs> they're usually in really good spots. And, um, you know, I just. 
That's Again, a great you look at how you look at how great the hockey is all over the United States. Yep. You look at what Dakota's doing. You look at what Denver's doing. You look at what Minnesota's doing. You look at what St. Cloud's been doing year after year after year. You look at Minnesota State. You look at the resurgence of Wisconsin. You look at the resurgence of Michigan State now. I yep. mean, it, it's hard. It's it's so hard. And, you know, hats off. We, we had Ben Barr in our program. What a job he's done at Maine. Hockey is yeah. back at Maine. And Maine travels. It's so good for college yeah. hockey. Fantastic. Yeah. They're great. They're great. And like I kind of said, it, it, like it's so big up there. That town, Orono, just revolves around what that team does and everything's sort of scheduled around their game. So it's it's, really <laughs> it's hard to be a visitor there, Jimmy. It's oh, hard bet. to be there as a visitor. Yeah. I can tell you, we were just yeah. there. I'm, it's hard. You're up in the middle of nowhere, you know, like <laughs> it's just you got to yeah. you got to buckle up and be ready. Um, Pierre, well, we got a little time here before Teddy comes on. So yeah. just a couple NHL topics I want to talk about. And we kind of touched on it a bit um, yesterday towards the end. But I just want to get your take, sort of elaborate on what Drew Doughty had to say when he called out his teammates. And he said that, you know, basically some guys are playing like they don't care and they got to care more. Um, and then the management came out. Well, a source told Darren Drager they're not going to make any changes. But Pierre, as we were saying, driving today. Uh, they're going into Colorado tonight, and it could get ugly there. Colorado's rolling right now. The morale is down for that Kings team right now. If they go in there and they get blown out, I mean, I, I would, I would hate to see it, but I think a change could be coming. I don't, I don't think it's necessarily the coaches' fault and one, one player in particular. But there's going to be a shakeup because this is a team. Pierre, a month ago, we were talking about going to the Stanley Cup, and now they're just you know, falling right down the standings. This is a team that everybody's talking about as being an elite team, and they were at that time, and it shows you how hard it is over an 82-game schedule mm -hmm. to maintain your consistency. Um, I really admire Drew. I, I just – I've always liked him. I've known him for a long time, going back to the World Junior days. We also traveled through Russia in 2007 for 21 days. Milan Lucic was on that team. Johnny Tavares was on that team. It was, it was an amazing experience, and Drew really – and if you think back to his draft year, it was down to Stamkos or Doughty. Mm -hmm. You couldn't get it wrong. Yeah. Regard whomever you picked. And obviously Tampa went one, they took Stamkos yep. and LA went two. So look at the Stanley Cups. Stamkos has two Stanley Cups. Doughty's got two Stanley Cups. I mean, you couldn't have got it wrong. Yep. They're both winners. In my opinion, both Steven and, and Drew are winners. And what I respect about what Drew did, he didn't mention names. But he challenged guys. The guys in that room know who they are. People that watch the Kings games, they know. Oh, yeah. They know who the players are that are poaching for points and aren't playing defense. Yeah. They know. And so sometimes those talks actually help teams. And coming from somebody that's got the street cred of Drew Doughty, I think that's going to carry some weight for LA. I do. I really do. Yeah. And, you know, he's been there for such a long time and he's still. You know, got the, him and Kopitar have the their hands still on those cups that they won. Uh, it, it made me think, though, Pierre, when I was thinking about the Kings, right, and just maintaining culture year after year, generations after generations. And, you know, I cover a team where, I mean, I've been lucky to see it. Like, it, it made me think of how amazing it is what the Bruins have done since basically, you know, 2008-09 season. They don't, they've only won one cup, but they've maintained this, mm. this status and this culture within their locker room where you don't usually see a Brad Marchand or a Patrice Berger or a Zane Char have to do what Dowdy did because the guys that don't buy in, they're shipped out right away. So and, just, yeah, go ahead. Keep going. So I wonder, like, I mean, if you're Rob Blake right now, do you sit back and kind of look at something like that and say, I may not think like talent wise, I want to lose this guy, but if he's not fitting into a culture that I'm trying to maintain here, that Drew Doughty's trying to preserve from the years where he won cups, it, do, you, do you sense like, instead of maybe the coach for once, Pierre, because that's what everyone's talking about in LA right now. Do you think maybe the move would be a player instead? Yes, I do. Uh, I don't think they're in a rush and Rob Blake already endorsed the coach. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, I've known Todd a long time, Todd McClellan, and, and I respect him so much. Going back to when he was coaching in the minors, you know, yeah. uh, he was part of the New York Islanders organization, played in Springfield, um, watched them play there for our, our dear friend, Jimmy Roberts, who passed away. So, again, I, I have a ton of respect for Todd and the way he carries himself as a coach uh, and as a person. 
Um, and I'm glad Drew said what he did. I think he challenged guys. I know some guys probably didn't like it too bad. That's just how it works. Mm -hmm. But I think that they're going to – and you got to remember, Luke Robitaille and Rob Blake are both Stanley Cup winners. They'll, they both know how important culture is, and especially Luke and Rob. They, they understand it. They really yeah. do. And I think if you don't – or you're perceived not to fit in the culture there, you're, you're probably going to be gone. But, I, you know, Rob learned a lot in L.A. from Larry Robinson, who brought it from Montreal. Luke learned a lot when he was in New York, but I think he learned the most in Detroit – and uh, and playing with Dave Taylor as well in L.A. I think, you know, Dave is such an amazing hockey oh, yeah. person. Yeah. So you look at it all. I think they're going to give the coach longer leash in L.A. I think they're going to I think they're going to punt a couple yeah. guys. And you'll know you'll know soon because what do we have coming up? We've got some dead time because of the all star break. Exactly. So it's time for them to evaluate and reset and get ready for that stretch run. I think we have uh, Ted Donato now bringing him in. Ted Donato, Harvard coach. Hey guys, how you doing? Hey Teddy, how you been? Excellent, excellent. Good to see you. Good to Coach, see you. Good to see you. Thank you for doing this. Really appreciate it. Oh no problem. Excited. Uh, love uh, love talking hockey with uh, two guys that know it very well. So yeah, I was just saying. Uh, you, you know, you went to Cath Memorial like my father. Uh, a, a proud knight uh, and a lot of Boston background there, and so obviously uh, we connect on that, Teddy. Um, but Ted, we want to be, before we want to get into the current stuff. We want to kind of rewind sort of your journey as a player and a coach um, and, and what it took for you to get where you are today. And I was looking back, you know, at the, the Harvard days that you had there. And obviously the highlights got to be um, that 89 team. If you can take us back to that and, and what it was like, you know, as Pierre said, you're going into Minnesota, they're in a term, you end up facing them in a final in their backyard. I'm guessing 90% of that arena is cheering for them. <laughs> um, a hostile territory. Uh, just take us back. What was that moment like for you guys? Yeah, it was, uh, it was very special. Um, I think coming into the year, uh, we Lane McDonald and Alan Borbo, uh, played on the Olympic team, uh, mm -hmm. the year before. And so we had those two guys coming back and we had a, you know, we had a freshman class, um, with, uh, you know, Peter Savaglia, John Weisbrod, uh, Mike Vukanich, um, and we and we brought in two freshman goalies in Chuck Hughes and Alain Roy. Uh, you know, Alain Roy now uh, a very prominent uh, you know uh, hockey <laughs> agent. Yeah, so um, so we we felt from the outset that we had a pretty competitive team. Um, you know, I remember going up to St. Lawrence uh, early on in the season, and I think they were fourteen and zero, and we were ten and zero, and uh, and the late great uh, Sports Illustrated actually was on the bus. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Um, wow. So it, um, yeah, it was it was a special time, and I think uh, we all felt it was great. Uh, you know, for the guys that we had from Minnesota to be playing in Minnesota, mm -hmm. uh, I would say myself, uh, I had a uh, probably a, a, a cockiness and a night, uh, and I was na naive enough to. Uh, you know, to really not uh, be intimidated um, going into Minnesota. I just thought that, um, you know, we were a really good team and, and we could beat them. Um, you know, it was, it was interesting. I remember uh, the late uh, great coach, Sean Walsh at Maine. Uh, Maine had played Minnesota in the semis. We played uh, the Michigan State team led by a guy named uh, Rod Brindamore, who was a, you know, oh, the, wow. the, the, the great freshman player. And, you know, and Kip Miller was on that team. And, uh Jason Muzzati was the goalie. Um, so, um, you know, we were able to, to beat them who, uh, you know, was one of the top teams all year in the semifinals. And then we got Minnesota. So uh, Sean Walsh actually went in, I think, to Minnesota's locker room after the game and said, hey, you guys, you guys play like that and you'll be national champions. So that kind of hit the right note with us a little bit. But it, <laughs> it was a heck of a game. I think uh, – I think the two rosters probably had a combined um, probably about eight to 10 guys that would ultimately uh, either see the national hockey league or represent the U S uh, on the Olympic team. Well, we're going to go to two quick moments from that game right now. Let's play this clip. First goal of the game, converting on the power play to tie the game at one. Back to Donato, the shot, he scores! Teddy Donato from the right face off circle with a bullet blast. Get into the back of the net to deliver the Crimson their first national championship. 
the side of the basketball semifinals following this hockey game. The shot by McCormick is down in front. Harvard, he scores! Harvard wins the national championship! Harvard stellar nine. So you had another goal after that too, and and Teddy, looking back on, I had forgotten what a seesaw game that was, eh? It really was, and I mean, you can imagine with you know ninety five percent of the arena, you know, cheering for their uh, hometown <laughs> Golden Gophers, uh, you know, that those momentum shifts shifts were were epic. Um, you know, I, I think uh, you know they had we had the you know. Uh, you know, just uh, newly anointed Hobie Baker uh, winner in in Lane McDonald, and they had the year previous winner in net in uh, in Rob Stauber. So, uh, mm -hmm. you know, great challenge for us. And um, you know, it's we watched it all as a group a few years back, and I have to say, um, you know, when you watch any old hockey, it probably looks a little slower than you remember it. Right. Uh, <laughs> but I, I will say this, the game was incredibly physical, you know, yeah. for teams that, you know, kind of prided themselves on, you know, being able to get up and down the ice and score goals. I think our power play that year was, was, you know, somewhere around 35% for the year. We had five forwards on it. So uh, wow. there were a lot of pucks that, uh, that we weren't <laughs> trying to keep in at the point with uh, for <laughs> myself. So, but uh yeah, it was a it was a great group of guys and um and a really special, you know, win. I think uh you know, as players, you know, going to a great school like Harvard is, you know, is always a a great opportunity, but then to have a chance to win a national championship at the same time, you know, was really uh super special and, you know, uh one of one of my great memories uh in hockey period. So, uh yeah. something I really look back to. You know, Jimmy, yeah. one of the great moments in college hockey is watching a team get anointed national champion. I was in the building that night. I'll never forget Teddy's shot. And I'll never forget Eddie Crayer's game-winning goal in overtime. And Chucky e. Hughes' little dance at the end as the goalie from Catholic Memorial is a good buddy of Teddy's. I'll never forget all that stuff. But what I wanted to talk to Teddy about, and that's why I'm so happy he's on for uh, on campus Friday, the greatness of the Harvard Cornell hockey series, Teddy, you've been part of it as a player. You're now part of it as a coach. You're playing again tonight against Cornell. Tell the viewers and the listeners at home, how great that tradition between Harvard and Cornell is. Yeah. I mean, I think in, in football, we have the game right here, you know, in the Ivy league, you got Harvard, Yale, but for us really, I mean, Cornell is the game for us. Uh, you know, this, this great tradition, Great players over the year. Harvard's had some great teams. Uh, Cornell, obviously, you know, uh, for us, it's the 89 championship team. But we've had great players like Bill Cleary and, you know, throughout the years, Joe Cavanaugh and Lane McDonald and, you know, Dominic Moore, on and on and on. But Cornell, obviously, you know, has uh, doesn't take a back seat to, you know, many teams. They have, uh, I still believe, the only undefeated, you know, season with Ken Dryden in the Nets uh, and, you know, also um, mm -hmm. guys like Joe Newendijk, uh, you know, that went through uh, Cornell. So it's it's a it's a really a great college rivalry. When we go up to Cornell, um, you know that that game is you know sold out, electric. You know, there's um, usually about uh, you know half uh, you know half of the uh, you know the stream or whatever you want to Kaluga's waters there. Uh, that you know they have half the half the fish are missing because they they throw them at the uh, at the players and the coaches at Harvard and uh, and then up here. I mean, I think they're expecting tonight's game to be um, the most attended game in the history of the building. So oh, wow. uh, it, it's been a sellout for some time, but even the standing room, you know, they I think were. Uh, Let's just say the fire department might be around uh, tonight to take a look. <laughs> but, Jimmy, just a little advance notice. Um, you know, Teddy's team won at Lionel Rink, which is a difficult thing. So they won there earlier this year. So okay. Mike Schaefer and Cornell's are going to be looking for some payback. And, and the second part is it's alumni hockey weekend at Harvard. So be careful if you're around Cambridge with some <laughs> of the guys later on after the game. Yeah. I mean, it should be – it should be uh, – quite a match uh you can kind of throw the the records out at this point and you know they're they're a very good team um you know and it seems to kind of swing in momentum i you know i think we're riding a little bit of a hot streak and maybe you know six or seven uh unbeaten versus them but 
uh, you know, if I wanted to be truly honest, I think there was, I think it was at least that before then that they had uh, on us. So, uh, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a great environment. This isn't a game that I have to spend a lot of time trying to, uh, you know, motivate my, my team. It's more about, Hey, play with passion, but uh, you know, toe the line and stay out of the box. Good stuff. I, I went with alumni weekend there. It's funny. We were just, uh, Pierre and I were just talking about sort of, Cult, generations of cultures in, in dressing rooms and preserving that winning culture, what have you, and uh, kind of helping that the young players understand that when they, at the NHL level. And I'm wondering, when you have alumni weekend like that, Teddy, how good of an opportunity is it for, for the players to kind of learn from the guys that have come before them and understand the tradition of Harvard hockey? I, I think it's a great opportunity. Um, you know, the players end up being pretty busy with the two games, but um, – you know, hopefully, you know, whether it's Saturday afternoon or Saturday, even after the game, um, they get a chance to, you know, see uh, how some of these alums feel about the program, you know, mm -hmm. and you see how they feel about um, each other as teammates. And, you know, to me, that's um, that's a tradition that uh, I'm so lucky to help carry on is that, you um, you know, we want to we want to be good on and off the ice. You know, we yep. have kids that are great students, but uh, you know, we're we're here to win, and I think that's the culture that uh, you know uh, that you know we we try to instill. Um, you know, there's a lot of you know hard work and sacrifice that goes into having uh, success, and uh, it's a it's um it's been an interesting, challenging year for us a little bit to this point, but uh, but I do think that um, our guys remain. Um, with a with a level of confidence because of uh, the culture here and and really the uh, you know I would say the 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 chemistry of, of the group in general um, is something that I think um, is is a real positive thing. Jimmy, one of the great things about what Coach Donato just talked about, he talked about the greatness of the program and all the people that came before. And I know one of his true mentors is, is Bill Cleary, the legendary coach and great American player. Um, how much did Coach Cleary mean to you, Ted, you both as a player and now in your current position as a coach? Because I know he's around the rink a lot. Yeah, no, I think um, he really is the standard for me as to kind of what this – the way this pro program should operate. Um, you know, we, we had uh, an incredible – uh, amount of success uh, when I was a player here, but but also um, we we just had a, a standard of character. I think um, you know his. We didn't have all these crazy rules and curfews. He you know he had basically you know one rule: don't do anything that would hurt you know the 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 program uh, in the eyes of the community and you know the, represent the program in a way that you would want to be represented. And I, I think our guys have really kind of uh, taken on to that. And I think uh, our guys are, you know, it's, it's a, it's a culture where it's, it's cool to want to do well in school. It's cool to want to push a little harder, a little extra, a little bit more physical to, to be successful. And I think that, um, you know, that all, you know, coach Cleary, you know, to me um, was, gave us so much confidence as players. You know, he did not spend a ton of time talking about the other team or worrying about the other team. It was, he, he wanted a certain style. He wanted, you know, the play to be, you know, clean and up the ice. And, you know, his, his, uh, his feeling was, Hey, you know what, they got to catch us to hit us. And, uh, and if they want to get physical, you know, we got to develop a power play that, uh, you know, that can make them, have to pay for that. And that's, uh, that's certainly a fun way to play and something that I've, uh, tried to emulate. Yeah. But the other thing too, J uh, Jimmy, I got to say this, he wasn't afraid to go out and get a kid by the name of Kevin Melrose from university of North Dakota to help Teddy's team. I heard his name a lot when I was listening to, I was watching those clips. Yeah. I heard Melrose a lot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He was the wrecking ball. You know, uh, yeah. I can't tell you there was, there was a, a, a long pipeline of players uh, from North Dakota to Harvard, but, uh, <laughs> but in that year, we certainly uh, needed him. He was great. Kevin Monroe was a heck of a player. He when, really was. Teddy, when did you know, like when, so you go and you become a pro player, um, you have a, a good solid career. And I'm wondering when did you start to get in your head? Was it like towards the end of your career? Was it after that? I want to coach was, or was it something you always wanted to do? How did that develop? 
So um, I, I didn't know, quite frankly. Um, I, I mean, I love the game. I mean, I, you know, I drive the Zamboni. I pick up pucks. I just love being there. I love <laughs> working with kids. I love, uh, you know, I love watching little kids enjoy the game. I, you know, I, I, I can't watch enough of it on TV. So I, I definitely love the game. I just didn't know if there would be an opportunity to stay in the game. And quite frankly, you know, after 13 years of pro and traveling all over the place with my family, you know, I was looking forward to at least being in one spot to try to mm -hmm. be a little bit uh, mm -hmm. more of, a, you know, uh, a father that was was around for some of the, the great moments of, you know, that you can have with your family and your kids. Um, so for me, um, you know, I certainly as I got older, paid attention a lot more to, you know, how coaches operated, uh, whether it was systems wise. So um, I, I definitely enjoyed that part of it. But I, I, I really didn't know. I know um, later in my career when I was with the Rangers, um, you know, uh, Glenn Sather had mentioned to me about, hey, would you have any interest in, you know, in coaching uh, a, a major junior team out in the, you know, in the Western League? And, um, wow. you, you know, and, and at the time, um, you know, I ended up playing another year after that. So I'm glad, you know, I may, may have missed out on an opportunity, but I certainly wouldn't have traded an opportunity to come back to the Bruins, which I, you know, I did my last year and got to, got to call, uh, you know, uh, teammates of guys like, uh, you know, Patrice Bergeron that year as a, you know, 18 year old, you know, rookie. So, um, so yeah, I, I didn't know. And, and quite frankly, um, you know, that, that whole landscape has changed. Uh, there's a lot more guys doing, you know, development work, you know, mm -hmm. out of uh, their hometown and kind of flying in and out of cities. And mm -hmm. there's a lot more virtual coaching and that kind of stuff. So, uh, you know, at the time, it, that stuff really didn't exist. So, um, you know, for me to have a chance to be at home, you know, I started to, I mean, the, the truth of it is I went and interviewed at a uh, commercial real estate firm and, um, you know, Mike Joyce was, uh, you know, who's got a lot of hockey connections, but, yep. um, and, and then the Harvard job became available. Um, so I went and interviewed that. I, you know, they both kind of came to fruition at the same time. Um, I elected to, yeah. uh, to stay in hockey, what I did know. Um, and, uh, I've enjoyed it ever since it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a truly a passion. The, the, the background as well as, you know, my, my dad was, a was a teacher and a coach. My younger brother was a coach. So, um, it was certainly in our blood, um, you know, to to enjoy sports and and love coaching. So, Jimmy, I'll just to, again to be totally clear: uh, when Glenn Sather offered that job to Teddy, he and Brian Burke owned the team in the Western Hockey League. He was in Chilliwack, BC, and okay. so they probably wanted to get Teddy on the cheap. I'm just trying to throw it out there. <laughs> <laughs> and Burke and, and Splash just a little bit. I That's probably would have had a long NHL career though if I went to the West. Oh, League. you would have you would have been taken care of for sure. But I, I really, and this comes from emotion. I remember being a young coach and going to watch Catholic Memorial play in Boston Garden in the championship. Yeah. And there were two players that stood out to me. One was drafted by New Jersey in the twelfth round, Chucky Hughes, and another guy who was a really good forward who didn't skate really fast but was really good with a puck. Kid named Donato, and I remember filing a report in my own mind saying that guy's going to make it. And it was Teddy. And then not too long later or not too long afterwards, actually I'm coaching in the NHL and he's playing on the power play on the point with Raymond Bork for the Boston. <laughs> and we're talking to each other and I couldn't stop laughing. I said, I knew the kid was going to make it. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's interesting, you know, Pierre, the uh, people ask me, you know, well, how was it when you went to the draft? I went to the draft um, to see Louis LeBlanc get drafted uh, first in the first round by Montreal for the first time in my life. Um, yeah. You know, it wasn't really a thing. I, I you know, I, I was speaking to Kevin Stevens last year and, he, you know, we, we swapped stories. He didn't know he was drafted for like two days later. <laughs> he was drafted, he was drafted by LA. It's a draft yeah. by LA. He was drafted and by LA. I, I, was, I was at a swimming pool. At, at one of my friend's house in the backyard in Hyde Park and got the call and said, Hey, you got drafted by the Bruins. And, and to be honest with you, there wasn't a lot of Americans yeah. you know, playing in the national hockey league. So, you know, for me, you know, I would have been, and, and I say this and people, you know, kind of laugh, but 
I, I would rather have gotten drafted by the Bruins in the fifth round than, you know, somebody else in the second round because the, the likelihood of actually making it at that time as a, you know, five foot nine American would probably mm. pretty, pretty slim, you know, and yeah. my dad, uh, who recently passed in the fall, um, you know, he actually used to keep me pretty grounded as I, I you know, I think when I was 17 year old, played on the 16 year old U.S. Uh, national team, the first one they put together. And then I played in the 17s, uh, actually in uh, Father Bauer Arena in, in Calgary. Calgary. Uh, Calgary. And I think I think the Canadian team, their defense alone had six first rounders. I think <laughs> Stefan Quintal was on that team. Uh, they had a forward by uh, by the name of Brendan Shanahan was on that oh, team. Geez. And, um, you know, we we had uh, my my age group was Joe Sacco, uh, assistant coach for the Bruins. Uh, Sean McEachran uh, was on that team. Um, you know, a kid named Adam Burt that had a, you know, a great run. Played coach, Hartford, coach, right? Adam, uh, coach Bones in Hartford. Yeah. yeah Adam, and, and, and Kip Miller. Uh, I think Kip Miller actually – didn't play on that 17 team. He played on the 16 team because he was going to go to Michigan state as a 17 year old. Um, but, um, that was, that was an eye opener for me because I played pretty well in the, in the series that, you know, I wasn't that far off and, you know, that, and, and, and even though it was, it wasn't something you could share with people because it wasn't realistic enough, you know, even my dad would, he was telling me to take the grad boards when I was, you know, a junior and senior. And I'm like, well, I played in the world juniors. I, you know, we won a national championship, but, um, you know, but even he was like, Hey, maybe you can get a job and, you know, get your master's paid for and be an assistant coach for a year, you know, get yourself through school. But, um, you know, certainly the guys that were just a couple of years older than me, really kind of changed the pathway for Americans. Uh, yep. You know, that Olympic team in 90, um, or I guess it would be 88. The, 88. the Olympic team in 88, yeah. you know, had some guys like Brian Leach and Kevin Miller and Mike Richter and Steve Leach. Uh, you know, there was, you know, Lane McDonald was on that team. Alan Bourbeau was on that team. But that team probably had um, – you know, I think uh, Reinhardt maybe that went to Calgary. They they probably had, you know, a good eight or nine guys. Kevin Stevens was on that team. They had a good eight or nine guys that had, you know, legit big time NHL careers, mm -hmm. and um, and that really just didn't exist. And now and now we fast forward it. Oh, it's crazy. To, you know, to we got you know, uh, you know, guys that you know three first rounders on one line at Boston College. You know, there yeah. was there was a time when there wasn't three first rounders in college hockey, you know, never <laughs> mind on one line. So, uh, yeah. so it's great to see USA hockey's come as far as it has. Um, I'm, in, you know, indebted because I had an opportunity to play uh, in the world juniors and the world championships, uh, the Olympic games. Uh, those are all lifelong memories. Well, go ahead, Pierre. I was just going to say, but, but Teddy's not telling everybody and I think he's being humble those were the halcyon days of Massachusetts and New England hockey, and he was a big part of it. And I'll just give you other names. Billy Guerin was part of that. Scotty Lachance was part of yeah. that. You start looking around the names of the guys. Uh, he talked about McEachern. We drafted McEachern in, in Pittsburgh. And yet Bobby Kellogg, you start looking at all those guys that played Tony Amonti, Jeremy Roenick. Like th those were amazing days. Yeah. Can you imagine, like, back in those days – you had a guy at uh, at Harvard that played with you, Teddy uh, Biotti. Chris Biotti was a first round pick of the Calgary Flames. I mean, he's playing against Demonte and Ronick when Thayer and Belmont Hill are playing. You know, the Fusco brothers were at Belmont Hill. I mean, you go down the line. The Halcyon days really were after the '80 Olympics, and Teddy was a big part of that and a driving force of that uh, in New England. And you you never take enough credit for that, Teddy. And I wanted you to know that. Well, thank you. I mean, it was. Uh... It was great days. I played in the old Catholic conference with in yep. my freshman year. I think Matt Neon had it was either 14 or 15 division one players on the one team, you know. So oh, it was yeah. it was a heck of a team. And I was, you know, I used to go uh Marty Pierce, who was the coach at Matt Neon, yep. um, lived in Hyde Park. His daughter Jennifer was a great kid and was in my class. So we used to go to the game, you know, Hyde Park kind of adopted Matt Neon, uh, <laughs> you know, at the time. And um and I remember going to the garden and watching, 
you know, uh, Bob Sweeney and, and, and Tom Barrasso take on, you know, Woburn and Johnny Carter and then Matt Yon with Steve Leach and, yeah. uh, and the Mohawks. Was, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it was, uh, it was, it was a great time. And, you know, uh, guys like, uh, you know, I, I got to play in that world juniors with, uh, with Roenick and Madano who were, you know, who were under ages, 17 years old and, you know, playing against, you know, Trevor Linden and, you know, uh, uh, I'm I'm trying to think of uh, who was the for, uh, Greg Hoggood, Hoggy Hockey. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, Greg uh, Hoggood. Yeah, Great. I'd like to see I'd like to see Greg Hoggood in today's game. I think oh, he'd get around the pretty good. He'd be uh, great. They had Theron Flurry. So I mean, it was uh, it was great opportunity, you know, to watch Mike Madano and watch Jeremy Roenick as 17 year olds go against the best players in the world. I think McGillney was on the the Russian team. Um, you know, those are those are great opportunities that allowed those guys to become the great players that they, that they became. What was that like Teddy, when you went from the Olympics, I remember too, cause I was a fan then going to all the Bruins games, with my grandfather and you know, you and Bob Joyce come in on the Olympics to the Boston Bruins. What was that transition like for you? Must, must've been a whirlwind at the time. eh? Yeah. So, so uh, Joyce was 88. When I came in, it oh, okay, was. Okay, that's right. I always. When get I that came confused. in, the Bruins uh, basically, I think they broke the record for the most players ever on a roster that year. Fifty-four. Yeah, uh, I oh, mean, put it, this, put it this way: the numbers were. Um, I think Steve Hines was. Uh, Steve Hines. That's what I'm saying. Steve Hines yeah. was. I think he was. He eventually turned it to Hines fifty-seven sauce, but I think he was. <laughs> I think he was forty-three. Uh, I was. I was. Uh, you know, I was uh, forty. No, let's see. Um, I should be able to remember that. But um, 49, I, uh, I was 46. Was Joey Juno. I was 46. Joe You're Juno 46. was 49. Yep. Gordy, Gordy Hines, who came from the Canadian Olympic team, was 47. Mm -hmm. uh, Clarky Donatelli, I believe, was 44. Oh, so, I mean, yeah. they, we literally added, you know, like five players. Uh, Timmy Sweeney, you know, like – we we added a whole bunch of guys, and I you know I remember uh, we actually you know were the last team in the playoffs that year. We went to Montreal, and this was a couple of years after you know Cam Neely and company had broken the curse. Uh, yeah. And we and we and we swept Montreal. We swept they, were, yeah. they were the number one seed, uh, and I remember uh, Peter Doris being on the ice with Pete Doris scoring the yeah. overtime goal in Montreal, and uh, you know it was great. We ran into. Uh, you know, a, a you know a, a tough squad in uh, in Pittsburgh that year with uh, yeah. Mario and company, and uh, they had a pretty good assistant coach too. <laughs> yeah, but, but I mean, to make the to make the conference fil finals that year, um, you know, it's one of those stories. I always I always joke and say, well, you know, it's my first year. I'll be back. You know, you know, plenty <laughs> of times, and you know, it's hard. It's it's hard. Yeah. I mean, we we're we you know we are spoiled around here. We've had the Bruins uh, competitive every year and we've had yeah. to me some of the great leaders in the last 30 years in the in the game of hockey mm -hmm. you know all time guys like Raymond Bork and Chara and Bergeron um I think that th those three guys will stand the test of time as mm -hmm. some of the all-time great leaders uh in our sport That'd so uh we've been we've been very fortunate and really enjoyed watching the the Bruins over the years I would agree. Totally agree with what you just said. That was so spot on. I have a quick story to tell Teddy. He doesn't know this one. So Rick Bonus was a head coach of the Boston Bruins then. Yep. And the two assistants were Michael Connell and Gordy Clark. And so I was on the bench with Scotty Bowman and Rick Kehoe. And we were all wired up. Everybody was wired up. It was on national TV. And the Bruins assistant coaches were talking to me. And I was talking to the Bruins bench with our headsets. So they had to turn them off because we were all talking to one another. And we, like all the messages, it was unbelievable. Bel Belichick so, must have been around. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it, was, it was unbelievable, Teddy. It was crazy. But awesome. um, in all seriousness, I think the Donato family is one of the elite athletic families ever in Massachusetts. And Teddy talked about the passing of his late father. Some of the nicest nights I ever had was just talking to Teddy's dad at the rink mm -hmm. um, or just away from the rink, but talking to him. And he was just such a passionate, not just for hockey, but all sports. Hey, Teddy, like he cared about all sports. It was unbelievable.
Yeah, I mean, he was a baseball player himself by trade, you know, signed with the Pirates, left uh, Boston College after his freshman year, um, played everything but hockey, um, you know, went to BC High, uh, Sam's big rival, <laughs> big rival. But, you know, played, played football, basketball, ran track, um, played baseball, obviously, and then, um, you know, went to BC, but you know, he was, he was someone that really appreciated all sports. Um, you know, love to see guys play other sports and develop as athletes. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting, his take on kind of how it is evolved now. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting because when we grew up, you know, we were, we were all, um, you know, benefactors of the big bad Bruins. So all of a sudden, you know, there was mm -hmm. these MDC rinks that would, would yep. you know, pop up all over Massachusetts. And we had one in Hyde Park. There was one in Milton. There was one in, you know, Dorchester, you know, South Boston, Charlestown. Uh, you didn't have to go very far. You know, for me, uh, you know, you could probably find a rink, you know, probably find three rinks within, you know, four miles in any direction. Uh, and, and, and so, it wasn't this huge commitment, you know, from a family to have their kids play hockey, you know, um, and we played youth hockey. You know, there used to be something that kids wouldn't even understand now is the, you know, you'd have your, you know, your, your local, um, you know, local league, you know, development league, it's like a house league, league. Yeah. house league. Exactly. And then you would have your, you know, your traveling, you know, your traveling team, if you were lucky enough to make it, but, uh, and then that evolved into having a triple A team or, you know, double A, maybe they called it now, you know, back then. But, you know, that was, you know, after you met all the requirements for your, you know, for your town. But it was it was such a great opportunity to be able to go to the rink and, you know, and be able to skate with friends and kids mm -hmm. that you went to school with. And um, there's no question to me that some of the specialization has hurt us a little bit. And, and my dad, my dad was a football coach, you know, at heart as well, uh, coached high school at Rosendale high. And his thought was, you know what, as, as it, you know, when you get high school aged athletes, you know, they go through so much, so much changes physically that the kid that was, you know, the superstar at 10 or 11, isn't always the same kid that was at, mm -hmm. you know, 15 or 18. Um, and sometimes the way it's specialized now, those kids don't have a chance to kind of get in the mix because it's, you know, it's become, you know, so um, I guess, you know, triple A dependent. So I, you know, it, it scares me that sometimes we don't, you know, we may, we may have missed some great athletes locally and um, yeah. you know, and that's one of the things I, I'd say I'm jealous about, you know, the state of Minnesota uh, is that, you know, I, I always, I always say, you know, Ryan Whitney, was a great NHL player. Uh, he's, you know, he's got a great, uh, you know, great uh, following now. But, you know, to me, if Ryan Whitney walked around Situate, you know, I mean, here's a, here's a guy that, you know, played at BU and, you know, had a great career and he's really done some incredible things. Uh, and I, I would say that, you know, he would barely be recognizable in Situate. And it's because there's not that local following yeah. Yeah. You know, that there used to be, you know, I mean, um, you know, I, I'm somewhat lucky now we have, you know, between my son, Ryan and Connor Garland, we got two kids, you know, from Situate that have made the NHL that, that grew up together and played, you know, yeah. might hockey for the, uh, you know, for this Situate team, uh, right. Seahawks. So, but, you know, some of that is missed, I, I think. And it's, it, it, it helps build the passion of the game. And I, you know, I think, uh, you know, everything's a little bit different, but, there's no question it for me, it still comes back to the, the Bruins and you, you know, I love watching the highlights of, you know, the whole Bruins team in the, in the hospital trying to, you know, break guys out of the hospital to celebrate. And, you know, I mean, that stuff, I mean, their, their impact in the community is still felt, you know, you can't yeah. go, you know, into places, you know, around Boston with one of those guys mm -hmm. and not have people, you know, just love, you know, the fact that they were, you know, they were so entwined with uh, the community. For sure. It's great stuff. One thing that is in entwined with the community is the bean pot, uh, and that's coming up. Uh, let's go to a clip. Of, uh, I'm sure you'll like this clip I got for you. Final seconds winding down for the first time in 24 years. The bean pot is covered in ivy. Harvard wins the 
65th B-Pod Championship, 6-3, the final score of a beating. So, Teddy, yeah, what was that moment like? It was great. Um, it was great to win it. We've, you know, we've certainly suffered enough over the years. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, and, and it was, uh, you know, to me, I was fortunate enough to be uh, on a team that won it at Harvard. And, you know, unfortunately, you, you really don't know as a player what the bean pot's like until mm -hmm. you get a chance to win it. And, you know, you right. get a chance to play in that, you know, in the finals and have success. And it really, um, it can change the culture of your, you know, of your community. It could change the culture of your team. Um, mm -hmm. You know, sometimes uh, I can often say with some of the failures that we've had after the first game, you know, guys are disappointed, but, you know, in some ways it's a really important hockey game that they lost, but, you know, they deal with it. But then the next Monday comes on and, you know, you play the first game and then you see the crowd for the second game and you see the the intensity and the, you know, the focus on it. And so it, it, it becomes apparent that it's a, it's a really, you know, big missed opportunity. And that's, uh, that's something that I hope our guys this year have a chance to, you know, last year we lost in a heartbreaking shootout. Um, mm -hmm. I don't, don't ask me if I like a shootout to, to, <laughs> to, uh, I to end the bean pot, but, um, but, it, you know, it's uh, it really is special. It is something that um, I think in Boston, you know, we own is different. And, uh, you know, it, it has changed. Obviously, uh, you know, when I was a kid, you know, there were, you know, there were 12 kids on, you know, on every team that, uh, you know, that played locally, you know, so mm -hmm. you didn't have to try to talk to them about what the bean pot right. meant. Uh, but, um, you know, it is it is still uh, an amazing, uh, you know, opportunity and a great showcase for the city of Boston and, and college hockey in general. Teddy, we can't thank you enough for your time. We know you're getting ready for Mike Schaefer and Cornell tonight with a sold out building at Bright. I look forward to seeing you tomorrow um, when the next Central New York team's in yeah, town. Yeah, tell that McGuire kid to take it easy on us. <laughs> <laughs> he's had yeah. quite a, Pierre won't, won't talk about it, but he's had an amazing year. Uh, yeah, he he's, has. Yeah. He's one of the best defensive players in the league. You know, a shutdown guy with size and toughness, but he's uh, he's found a way to the score sheet this year. You know, uh, so really, he's kind of a 200 foot guy right now, and uh, you know, really leading uh, that team in a lot of ways. So uh, great to see. Congrats, Pierre. Uh, I will not be disappointed if uh, if he doesn't have his best night of the season tomorrow. I'll, I'll just look forward to visiting with you tomorrow on alumni night at uh, at Bright. That'll be fun. Well, thank you guys. And Murph, uh, always love your, your coverage of the Bruins. Thanks. Um, you know, and uh, you guys do a, a great job. I, I enjoyed being on it. And uh, hopefully, Pierre, when I see you tomorrow, I'm, I'm still in a good mood. You know, I that get means, it. That means it's done all right. So <laughs> thanks, all right. That means all right. Thanks, thanks, guys. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ted Donato joining us here on On Campus Friday, the coach of Harvard, former NHLer as well. We forgot I forgot to bring in the clip of Cunnyworth. We'll we'll get it next time. Oh, don't he's yeah. coming back on. Oh yeah. So the but, one thing yeah. you need to know about Teddy, like he watches as many games as you and I do, and all the fans that really are passionate about the NHL. Yep. And he really does. Like we yeah. talk about it from time to time. But uh, the thing that really blows me away, I just remember how great a scorer he was. And, mm -hmm. and it was really at a time when people would say, oh, he's probably not going to make it. He's a step slow. And I'd be like, no, this guy's making it. I'm you could yeah. tell right away. He had a flair for the dramatic. He's an amazing athlete. And uh, he could really shoot the puck. Like he, he, and he thought he processed the game amazingly well. Amazingly and he's great, well. gritty, too. He was a gritty player. Very, yeah. very gritty. Yeah, and, and, and the thing, I thought he made a good point there, too. And he wasn't talking about himself at the time because I know he's humble. But – I mean, you think about it now when he was coming in, right, Pierre? Like he said, it was tough for small guys then. I mean, you know, if you weren't. Well, the red line was in. You couldn't. Make, yeah. Like it was tackle football in the neutral zone. People it's, don't really remember it, exactly. but I'm telling you, it was a whole lot of nasty. So you, if he had come in in today's game, oh. he probably would have had a much more, longer career and scored a lot more points. I mean, because it's catered more towards players like him. And so. Um, but he's, he, he was able to overcome all that and good for him. Uh, and just, and he's done, I, I can he's tell a class you, like, act too. He, he, he bleeds crimson, you know, he really does. Like, he does. And, and I, I know he was being humble. He's one of the better players that ever played there. I'm just yeah. telling you. Was. Oh, for sure. and, and coach Cleary to me was the most perfect person 
to teach Teddy what it was to be a Harvard guy. Mm -hmm. Coach Cleary is an amazing man. I don't know if you've ever had a chance to meet him, Jimmy, but a couple times. I, I'm just a um, phenomenal, also, phenomenal yeah. man. Um, I, you know, it shows you how old I am. I coached against him, so <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. Uh, but no, he's he's an amazing person, and he coached so many good players over the years. And Teddy nailed it. He just wanted you to do things the right way. Yeah, he really did. He yeah. really did. And if you were good enough to be a pro, well, go be a pro. But yeah. he wanted you to do things the right way. And yeah, one of those things was to get your degree from Harvard. Yeah, which is an amazing feat. I mean, almost I'd say equal to making the NHL. I mean, think yeah. about it. You're getting a degree I agree. from Harvard. I agree. So, um, yeah, and you know what? Too, I I remember too, and I didn't bring it up there. I didn't want to, but he he reached out to my family when my dad passed in 2014. My, my dad knew a lot of people. He was a lawyer from Boston. So he, he knew a lot of people around Boston <laughs> and uh, CM as well. So, yeah, I, I'll never forget that. And he was he was great when he came in uh, his second tour of duty with the Bruins that year. He referenced Bergeron's rookie yep. season, 3 4 Don't forget, Joe Thornton was on that team as well. Yeah, he was. Uh, they're a pretty stacked team, actually. Of course, the Canadians got in their way again in the playoffs. Um, but I just remember he was great. And, and you know – he he was so proud like he just said you could tell it again when he was there he was so proud to be a bruin and yeah. you know i don't think like people get what that means maybe around the country or in canada for a kid for bought from boston just like anywhere though to play for your hometown team is something and sometimes it doesn't always go well it no. can it can be tough because there's so much added pressure um but he just embraced it so much i mean he you said he bled Harvard. Well, he bled black and gold too. Oh no, I mean, there's no question about that. There's yeah. no question about. It. Do we have any questions? Do we have any? Yeah, people let's have... go to some questions. And actually, Randy Workman is pretty psyched up that he played at uh, Father David Bauer Arena out in <laughs> Calgary. Yeah. All right. uh, let's go to some questions here. What do we got? Alex Evanowski, just curious, but what do you think of Penn State's hockey program for just starting out? Well, Guy Godowski has done a phenomenal job there. I had the privilege of working with Guy when he played for our American Hockey League team in Prince Edward Island way back when. He was a heart and soul player, kid that played at Colorado College. He does everything right. Before he got the Penn State job, he was coaching at Princeton. He did a really good job at Princeton. Uh, I think Guy's done a fantastic job with that program and really one of the nicest on-campus facilities in all of college hockey is in Happy Valley at Penn State. Yeah, I've heard they've kind of tried to emulate the stadium too. They have the whiteouts and everything. It's really it's a spectacular place, and and guy deserves a huge amount of credit for what he's done there. Good stuff. All right, next question, Jimmy. Would you give DeBrusque five to five to six million that he wants? Do you think he has warranted it? Well, I I don't know if that's exactly what he wants. I haven't seen any official numbers or been told off the record numbers yet. I know you might have read my story. I mean, that's that's a guess. I'm guessing that's what he could get. And, you know, actually, Pierre, if you want to talk about it, we've had we were kind of discussing this and there's some good comparables out there for him right now. And given the fact now that he's proven himself to be so multifaceted and, and a weapon on the penalty kill as well, can play both wings, you can use him on the PP, obviously even strength. His value is going up pretty fast, Pierre. I would, uh, if I were the agent, I'd be using Drake Batherson as one comparable, and I'd be using Travis Konechny as another comparable, and know that those deals were signed a couple years ago, so there's going to be obviously inflation on the deal in favor of the Brusque. But here's what I do know. If the Bruins don't sign him, and you know I don't know if they will or won't, I, I'm sure they value him, I guarantee you an Alberta team will offer him a major contract. Yeah, I guarantee you. Whether it's Edmonton or Calgary, he's going to be taken care of in the in the province of Alberta if Boston doesn't sign him. And that's not a scare tactic. It's just it's reality. I mean, yep. there's a need there for that type of player. And 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 you know what, Jake, he's all you know. I think you've talked to him. He's always been one of my favorites. I go so far back as I watch his dad Louis play for the London Knights, and his dad was tough as nails. They're com two. Yeah. Com Completely different players. Yep. Two completely different players. Completely. But very valuable. Both of them very valuable. For sure. And by the way, too, just so our listeners know, I will actually – I had a great one-on-one -on -one with uh, Jake. I know I wrote a little about it in Boston Hockey Now yesterday, but 
I'm going to expand on that in a column, but we're also going to play the video interview of that next week. So we'll let you know. We'll throw it up on our social feeds as well. So I look forward to that. Uh, all right, next question. Justin LeBron, how much is the situation with Carter Hart affecting the Flyers? Well, you know, I think Pierre, Pierre and I both said that yeah. that was going to be uh, weighing on them mentally, and you combine it with the way they had already been playing as it happened. I think it's just it's it's a whirlwind of negativity that they yeah, didn't need right now. They've lost four games in a row now. Um, this has been around the team for a while, I think. Um, but I just – the one thing I do want to say – as much as it's affecting the hockey part, there's other parts to it too um, on both sides. And I just, I'm really uncomfortable talking about it just because it's just, it's unbelievable to think about. And I just prefer to try to make sure everybody gets it right. This well, thing's got to get done right. Yep. It really does. It has yeah. to get done right. And I want to say too, um, you know, I, I know our fans, I know you guys, and I appreciate, I mean, obviously it's a, it's a, newsworthy topic it's it's at the top of the news unfortunately right now but another thing we have to make clear too and you know i've kind of been given not warnings because i haven't said anything but just a heads up is you know we not just because we don't want to touch on it until the facts are out and, and it's such a a sad topic to discuss but there's also a lot of legal ramifications too so we have to watch what we say too because a lot of people are listening and watching and it's as, should, as they should be, because unfortunately, when a situation like this comes, rumors will spread, uh, accusations are going to fly. We would rather just leave it be right now. When everything is resolved, we will react to it. But obviously, it's just a horrible, horrible thing. And I, I, I think we'll leave it at that. But on the, on the hockey side, though, Pierre, I want to stick with the Flyers a bit. I do think they have a good chance to kind of harness some positivity that's about to be around their team. And I don't know if you, you, you're aware of this, but the Flyers and the Bruins alumni are playing there tonight. Mm -hmm. um, and ironically, two former uh, Bruins from the 2011 Cup team are going to be playing on the Flyers team, and that's Mark Recchi and Dennis Seidenberg. And tomorrow they're going to honor Mark Recchi at the Wells Fargo Center. I don't know if it's any intermission or before the game. Um, in a matinee, 12.30 matinee, and I kind of look at that as maybe maybe that's exactly what Torts and the players need right now, just this infusion of nostalgia, fans having a little buzz. It's an afternoon game. Everybody's excited. Maybe that's the distraction they need right now. And I wouldn't be the least bit surprised. I know on paper the Bruins are a better team. They had a gutsy win last night. But the Bruins are playing their last game before their break. They're all going off to warm places after. And I, they're human it's got to be in their head. The beaches, the sun, the cocktails, it's all going to be in their head. I I kind of see maybe a, a bounce back game for the Flyers tomorrow. They, and they want they want to snap this streak too. So I think it's a good opportunity for them. Yeah, and they're running out of racetrack too. I mean, they want to yeah. stay relevant in the playoff hunt. Um, but I, I, everything you said about the other incident, I agree with. And you've we talked about it the day the Carter Hart story broke. And I told you it's not appropriate for us to talk about exactly. it. We just don't know anything about it. And one more thing on the Flyers, too, Pierre. I was listening. Uh, uh, Brian Boyle was on with our good friend Jeff Merrick. I was listening driving up here to Portsmouth, and he was talking about Tortorella. And he, he was saying how – and we should we should get Boyle on the show. He's great. St. Sibs kid, too. Uh, he was talking about, like, yeah, is he tough? Yeah. Did I have arguments with him? Yep. But you know what? I don't become the person or the player that I am today – without John Tortorella. I, I completely agree with that. I did most of those games when Brian played there, uh, and John was hard. He was mm -hmm. hard on Brian. He was hard on Rick Nash. He was hard on everybody, but he was hard on, on Nash and Boyle in particular. I'm telling you, he was hard on those guys. You know but, what he, he And was, Kreider, too, by the way. He was yeah. hard on Kreider, too. He said, you know what he's good for a coach like Tortorella? And he was just saying in general, to have a coach like that is good. If you remember, I mean, Brian Boyle was a pretty high pick. Big kid coming out. First round pick of LA. He was in that Nashville draft, right? Yeah. The the O three draft, which is draft. In my yeah. eyes the best draft ever. Maybe yes, it's the best. It's the best draft ever. Yeah. So he's in that draft, and like Pierre, he gets the NHL, and it never really went. It wasn't going towards the superstar level that maybe he and others around him, and and you know the media and everything built up around him. And he said Tortorella was exactly what I needed to find my niche, to find 
my role to stay in the NHL and help me, helped humble me, you know, to understand, okay, maybe I'm not going to be that, you know, 50 goal scorer or whatever, but I still can have a lot of value to a team. And so I, I thought it was great. And again, it goes to show you the job that Tortorella is doing this year and has done in the past. Yep, I agree with you. We got to get going here because oh, there's other hockey stuff to do. Yep, one more question here and we'll close it out. Randy Workman, if you get the chance, how long do you give a goalie prospect before he becomes a bust? It's a good question. That's a really good question because I've seen some guys, everybody writes them off and then all of a sudden they come back and they shock everybody. And I've seen other guys start unbelievably well and then just totally Jim peter Perry. out. Yeah. So it's really hard. I don't think one size fits all when it comes to evaluating goalies. But the one thing I would say, of all the positions in, in the NHL or in hockey, forget the NHL, and all the positions in, in hockey, it's the best coached position. Mm -hmm. It really is. It has to be. It, but it wasn't for a long time. It's yeah. just guys relying on their ability. Now it's the best coached position. It really is. And that's why I think it's just – it's so important to have a good goalie, you know, it's case everybody by can case. say whatever they want, but if yeah. you don't have a good goal, you're not going to win a lot. No. And it's case by case. I think you're exactly right here, but the one common thread I think that needs to exist is patience. hundred percent. hundred percent. That's yep. the biggest thing. Well, listen, we want to thank Ted Donato, Harvard men's hockey coach, join us here at an on campus Friday. That was great. That was a lot of fun. Thanks. Oh for my gosh. Enlightening stuff. And uh, Pierre, you have some fun watching Dartmouth and Colgate tonight. Good luck to Ryan and uh, mm -hmm. enjoy it. And then it's great that you get to see your daughter as well. It's a, a great surprise. I'm happy for you. And for all our viewers out there, thanks for another great week. And uh, to our production crew, same to you. Thank you. This has been another edition of the Eye Test on the Sick Podcast Network. And that's a wrap. Hope you don't miss us too much until next time. Follow the eye test with Pierre McGuire and Jimmy Murphy on YouTube, Facebook, Google Play, and Apple Podcasts.